Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, thanks so much for joining us for yet another episode. And I'm here with a new friend of mine, Braden Flynn. Braden, thank you so much uh, for making time for the Boca Podcast. You got it. Stoked to be here. Well, and we had the opportunity to meet a few weeks ago. I was in California for a business trip, and uh, we we had the chance to sit down to dinner. And I want to kind of get into that, a little bit of that conversation here in just a little bit. But you are a man of many talents. Part of the reason that we're having this conversation today, I was quite taken by you and your personality. You're a photographer, uh, a content creator, an entrepreneur, a salesperson. And, And just for those of you listening in, for a little bit of context, and of course, we'll link to these in the show notes, but... Braden's photography website is B R A E D O N, bradenphotography.com. Uh, you also run filmsupply.club, just like it sounds, uh, and literally a film supply company, the photoreport.com, the artistreport.com. You've got your own personal YouTube channel. So you're, you're a content creator at, at the least and an interesting conversationalist. But one of the things that you said to me leading up to our conversation, uh, you just mentioned this in passing, but I found it really interesting. You said you have a hard time trying to figure out what to focus on in life. Uh, And I know I can relate to that. Probably many of our listeners can, but I'm curious what drives your tendency to multitask or to take on a lot of different projects. Is there a particular big idea that you're trying to fulfill or a mission that you're trying to accomplish? Where does that come from? Well, we're going to go straight deep psychological right right off the bat. Absolutely. (laughs) I think realistically. So I, I live in Southern California and I, you know, I've actually been trying to figure this out for a bit with myself doing more like introspective work because I, I think back to call it, I mean, high school, I, I started working when I was 15 and it wasn't like I was in this desperate need where or my family was out. Like family was decently okay, but I always sort of had this drive to work. I was really interested in stock markets. I was really interested in real estate. I read a ton of I, I think my dad turned me on to audio books, but you know, cassettes books on tape, literally. Yes. Um, and I started listening to him and this guy, Brian Tracy, who's, he does a lot of time management. I think he's not with us anymore, but um, an older guy that one thing that always stood out with me because I grew up around a lot of music. My dad was a musician and I have a big passion for that. So, but he described listening to radio in the car. It's like, Hey, listen, I like music too. But it's sort of like ear candy. You eat a bunch of candy, you fill yourself with that, you're mm. just going to feel crappy later on. But the same deal, you could be, for the amount of time that you're driving, you could have a, basically a four-year master's education with what you consume in the car. And so from there, I basically, when that was like early days of high school, sort of trained myself to start listening to audiobooks. And so I think there's part of me that there's drivers that have been natural, and then there's drivers that have sort of, I've always been trying to learn and get better and grow. So I think those are some tickers there. I think now the, the element of continually starting things part of, partly is interest. It's like I, I started the Artist Report podcast, which scratch that. It wasn't even, <laughs> I started it out thinking like, oh, here's a good idea. Like let's start it out as a video blog series, which is the hard, like if you're going to do something along this line, like interviews and podcasts, like the video side is so much more difficult because one, I'm a photographer. I had to learn video. I had to learn video editing. I had to get a crew to come with me and shoot for me. Plus I had to be physically with the person that I was doing. So I was driving a lot. It was like full days to record a simple thing. So I've got those up on YouTube. That was more so like I have so many people in my life that are really, really talented. And I just wanted to be able to draw those stories out of them. Cause that's something I feel like one I'm interested in is like what, what makes certain people who are really talented successful or some people that are like crazy talented they never like do anything with their talent or with their art and then the people who are like mildly talented but are crazy successful so i'm like really intrigued by all those different scenarios and and wanted to like actually hear stories from people and draw those out from some of the people that i knew and yeah so i think there's drivers in that direction but then constantly starting new things i think i'm like at the stage of 
now, you know, I'm, I'm in my late thirties and I've got four kids living in Southern California, pretty close to the beach. So it's not the cheapest <laughs> area to live in or like life that I have. And, yeah. you know, I'm on the poor side of the rich town. So my kids are private schooled. And that's not cheap. So I think there's this driver of, of like in the back of my head of it's almost, I'm not necessarily comparing myself to this, but sort of in the stage I am in my career, it's like being a pro athlete who's like, you don't have that much longer. Maybe, maybe you do. So how do you capitalize on where you are and, you know, start your fragrance line or your, your clothing company or your, your thing that you can then like do beyond your career? You know, so I think there's a, a little element of that of feeling a bit squeezed um, of like how, you know, how long is if shooting weddings is my main gig? It's like, am I still going to get hired into my 50s? Am I still going to get hired into my 60s? Do I want to be hired in my right. 60s doing this? Right. Uh, so so there's, I think there's been a sense of desperation of like, I have to figure something else out that's going to work. So I'm throwing all sorts of spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. Yeah. And, and a lot of that is then knowing you, you sort of have to create a lot of content before you actually know if it's sticking or if it's not. And sometimes it takes like years before that, before those channels you put all this time into even actually like do a thing. So I'm just spending a ton of time doing a lot of stuff and here I am. And seeing what sticks. I like that analogy. That's exactly. really, really good. And, and what I find interesting as well is that a lot of what you do is driven by a desire for growth and a desire that comes from curiosity, which are both ideas that I can very much relate to. And I think it drives a lot of how I spend my time too. In fact, I have a, a list of values that I review regularly. And one of those is very simply growth. I, I don't want to become stagnant uh, really on, on any level. And so I'm curious or constantly in, and curiously exploring and trying things and, and certainly starting businesses as well. So I can relate to that. Something that you mentioned in passing there that I find interesting, and I'm curious to get your take on this, um, is the idea of consuming audiobooks and, and really content as a whole. Um, as somebody who is admittedly curious yourself, and certainly myself as well, I'm curious to get your perspective on how much content is too much content to consume when especially you compare it to kind of the ratio of, well, let, let's look at it as the ratio of content consumed to the amount of content that we actually do something with or that we act on. What do you think is a healthy balance there? I don't know if there is necessarily a healthy balance. I think the unhealth is if you're constantly consuming content and never doing anything with it. And I think the, if you know the name Gary Vaynerchuk, he, for people that don't know him, he's a prolific speaker. He's a massive entrepreneur crazy successful. Uh, but he he's a lot of his mantra is he's giving people just like kicking them in the ass to say like, you need to like actually work. Yeah. And but one of the things he says, like, listen, I give everything I know away for free. Because I know that 90% of people that hear this stuff are not going to do anything with it. So I think there's that element of trying to learn stuff, but never actually doing anything with it. I think that that is sort of detrimental. So, so I'm actually, because like you do get to a point of like sort of overload, I'm now doing more on demand type learning. So it's like, if it's when I was launching, I launched film supply club about a year ago. And you mentioned that earlier, but basically it's a way like it's a membership based site that as a member, you get wholesale pricing on film and other photo supplies and other relationships. And, you know, that idea came to me while listening to a book while at the gym, you know, so and part of it, so I was like trying, a lot of my listening is like trying to get inspired and hear ideas be like, oh, like this could be a thing. And then like after the launching that, I've been really like, tr I was having to learn a lot of digital marketing and having to learn like growing and scaling. I'm having, so a lot of the books that I'm reading are about the thing that I'm trying to do, or as I'm reading, I'm actually trying to force myself to implement the things that I'm learning about. I like that. Yeah, because it's easy, and, and you were alluding to this, but it's easy to consume. And I, I think actually, not just simply not act on that content that we're consuming, but it's even convenient, right? It, we can feel good about ourselves. And I'll speak for myself, I can feel good about myself. And I've certainly been guilty of this, where I'm consuming content, and I feel, you know, semi intellectuals, I'm reading the variety of books that I do. And yet, at the end of the day, if I'm not actually doing anything with that, what is the actual benefit to my life. I might be able to speak to ideas, but there's a big difference between being able to discuss an idea and actually do something about it. And uh, I think in this day and age, because we have such easy access to so much content, 
it's easy to get lazy. Um, so I'd like that you are actually doing something about it. And I think it's relevant to any and everyone listening, the idea that they consume content related to whatever the project is in the moment. I think that's a, a great practical first step. So I appreciate you sharing that. I, I mentioned that that I can very much relate to you on the element of growth and or curiosity. But something else that we have in common is something that you mentioned to me at dinner when we met about a month ago, a month and a half ago. Uh, and that is that you actually have a background in youth ministry. Now, this is something that probably most of our listeners don't know. I actually studied Bible and youth ministry in college. That was a whole different life ago. But I'm curious about your background in ministry and how you made that transition from ministry to photography. What did that journey look like? Yeah, well, it and and I think it still plays out in sort of some of the drivers that I have, which is like caring for people and helping people. But the it, it came where I mean I was in actually commercial I went to school at USC here in Southern California for business and was in commercial real estate and that whole time I was volunteering as basically the junior high youth group leader and driving down from LA to Orange County every weekend and then for sometimes midweek events and then after college the when I was working at it was CB Richard Ellis commercial real estate the the high school pastor left and they sort of jokingly made they they made an offer but sort of knew it was like you're already working in commercial real estate why would you take this they made the i basically offered to like hey would you want to be the high school pastor and it was actually like it it made me like think obviously i i thought and i did it but the the whole process for me like the whole reason i was wanting to work commercial real estate is because it's a pretty lucrative career and you can all, I, I wanted to learn how to invest in real estate so I could invest in real estate and then be able to have money so I could live in Orange County and volunteer my time to be able to help people or be in youth ministry or some sort of ministry. And I like someone told me this story of this little fisherman in a small village. Let's it was in Mexico. And, you know, he would go out every day and he would fish and come back. He'd be out early, he'd fish, come back, have enough for his family. Then he'd spend the rest of the day with his family, take a little siesta and go out and do it again the next day. And this American guy, of course, this, us Americans, came down and saw this little village and what this guy was catching. He's like, listen, I can build you. A, I'm going to invest some money. We're going to like take out loans. We're going to get a fleet of fishing ships. We're going to be able to go out there. You're going to be the wealthiest man in your town. We're going to start exporting, blah, you know, this whole story. And then at the end, the the like punchline to shorten it is the little guy, the the Hispanic guy at the end of the story says like, well, okay. And then what? And he says, well, then you can, you know, go fish in the morning, come back, take your siesta, hang out with your family afterwards. So it's like, (laughs) that's what he was already doing. And it was all this for what, and, and so many things that I felt like could get in the way. So I basically made the decision to be a youth pastor and did that full time for, I think somewhere around, let's say seven years. And that whole time it was a small little one service church. And the the main executive pastor he really encouraged a bivocational situation because like really how long can you be working at a small church in youth ministry and survive in orange county and so at that time i was shooting a lot of music and bands and i was i was shooting bands like three or four nights a week i started a music blog at that point and doing more fashion lifestyle editorial photography and then i started at some point through connections in those worlds, like the fashion world, I started taking on weddings from those sort of people and was able to be really, this is something that I, when I'm educating other people who are wanting to be photographers, I say, don't quit your day job. Because like the the position that I had was like, I could be really picky and choosy with the jobs that I took on and only took on the jobs that sounded rad, that were going to be rad with really cool people. Yeah. And the, the first handful of weddings I photographed got featured in a lot of places and I started getting a lot more inquiries and it got, got to the point where I was saying no to most weddings coming my way and I wasn't really traveling because I had to be there on the weekends. And then when we had our first kid, which he's now nine, so that was nine years ago, I my wife was thinking like, okay, you need to like focus more on our family versus other people's families and let's see how you do with photography. And so I had, I think this was December. I had weddings on the books. The first one, I, yeah. So it was, it was scary having our first kid. Didn't re- like, I was only taking on like, I don't know, 10 ish weddings a year. And that December I shot a wedding 
that got featured. It was basically in Sweating in the Rain at this really cool ranch, really cool couple. And it got featured on like a, several different blogs. And I went from two weddings on the books to I shot 65 weddings that year between the last weekend of April and December. And I was still shooting bands probably three or four nights a week wow. and shooting. <laughs> um, and I ran at that pace for probably, I don't know, three-ish years until I started really upping my prices. And then, yeah, so that's that's sort of how the the long version of how the transition happened. But uh, you mentioned something in particular, which was the significance of caring for people or having an outlet to care for people. So going from youth ministry where you had much more of a readily available opportunity to do that kind of on a proactive or in a proactive manner, do you find that it was that, that you, I guess, incorporated those tendencies to be caring, to show care toward people in your photography business? Did you find ways to, to, to do that very thing? I mean, 65 weddings a year is just an incredible amount. I know you've cut back since, but did you find ways to, to personalize that experience for the clients to be able to care for them, to make them feel taken care of or make them feel special? Yeah, I think that's that's something I probably do pretty naturally in my personality. But and and I would say it's it's probably a reason for a decent amount of my success is how I am at an event, plus with the people that work at the event, plus the couple and all that. But um, I think in those in those early years, it was I was just like hustling my tail off and working, and and now but now it's at a stage where it's like I feel like I have a friend named Eric Kelly who's another really rad photographer. Um, he, he describes it as sort of like you've got different stages where you're sort of in it, but then you have this platform stage where then you're in a place where you can then like help people that are younger than you help people that are just trying to get to where you are, where you've been. And um, so that's, that's actually where outside of the curiosity where like the heart of the artist report and the photo report came about because, and there's another thing that I don't think we talked about at dinner that night is, co-founded with a few other friends it's called connecting things where it's basically we have seven different people who are the founders and it's a once a month speaker series that we now have about we've been doing it for almost three years but we have about 200 people that show up every month and we did have different speakers from different like illustrators designers entrepreneurs freeze a lot of freelancers and so but the heart of like all of this is like this real care for the that freelance artist entrepreneur that is now running a business that is sort of struggling at running a business and so i have a big heart for that and so a lot of the stuff that i'm trying to educate on or draw out when i'm interviewing other people is not just like the glory but like what's hard right now or like what's been difficult yeah. and yeah so so i think that's where it comes out now is i'm at more of that platform stage where i can be helping people who are wanting to get to a higher level, I guess. Well, and, and, you know, I will say that personally, the most fulfilling or some of the most fulfilling years of being a photographer and an entrepreneur have been those years where I very proactively invested in the community or in the industry. Uh, and, you know, the podcast certainly as of the last couple of years or so has been an outlet in that regard. Uh, but even just doing things like answering questions on forums back when photography forums were a thing or, you know, Facebook groups now, I think it's a great example and reminder for all of our listeners to, even if it's on a very, very simple level, to make sure that you're giving, that you're that you're helping, and that you are ultimately showing care to others by means of just giving them a little bit of assistance, um, answering a question, giving a little bit of advice, making a suggestion along the way, because it really makes an impact. Um, and it, it's so fulfilling. I mean, to your earlier point, it does take some time when you're creating content to to actually see an impact in whatever the industry that you're working. It took probably a year and a half or so, maybe a little bit more be before the Boca podcast really began to make an impact. And then it was really so fulfilling to, to get emails from people saying how much a difference it was making in their life. You've got to put the time and effort in, but at, at the, at the very root level, if all you have the opportunity to do is, you know, answer a question for a photographer at a local meetup or answer a question in a Facebook group, making that concerted effort to to give to others is so incredibly fulfilling. And, and I love that you're setting that example and you're doing that on an ongoing basis. Something else that you mentioned and, and passing there too that I want to highlight is the significance of not quitting your day job before you go full-time with photography. Because a lot of photographers or, or those who are wanting to get into photography these days 
are you know, either full-time professionals or maybe they're they're at home and they aren't reliant on photography as a as an income as of yet. And so they have the opportunity to be extremely selective in their target market that they go after and the brand that they ultimately create. And I think that's a really good reminder as well. There's there's a lot of question around, you know, how do we price ourselves? How much do I charge for this thing or that thing? And I think the conversation gets overly convoluted and complicated. At the root level, it's important to be very clear about your personal goals, the motivation, as you and I talked about earlier, um, that, that's driving this move into photography then using that as a baseline to understand the target market that you need to go after to charge the amount of money that you need to in order to make the living that you want to. And uh, rushing into any and all kinds of photography is not the most intelligent way to go about it. Don't quit your day job. Maintain the income that you have so that you can very selectively move into the market and create an extremely distinct uh, specialized brand that will enable you then to be able to effectively create a living, would you say? Yeah, I I think, I mean, all of that is right on. It's if you, I listen to a lot of podcasts, I listen to a lot of you know books, but a lot of the like passive income type podcasts where it's a lot of online marketing or a lot of online make your money online, whatever. Everyone is talking about like how do you quit your day job and like do your your side project, your side hustle full time, and like really, especially like if art or creating is your passion and you're trying to make a career out of that, there's something to it that like sometimes sucks the passion and the fun out of that when all of a sudden you have to make a living doing that thing. And so, I mean, obviously it, it can be pretty awesome, but it can also be a life suck. So the the like best thing about not quitting your day job is the fact like being desperate in any situation is a bad situation. It's like being desperate when dating, like nobody wants <laughs> you, you when you're desperate for them. You know, yeah. it's like, it's, it's not healthy. It's not like huh. it's, sort of repulsive sometimes but also like on the sake of like needing work or needing money and being desperate like taking anything like at a, at a certain point you can look at it as like okay this is my the passion is this thing and so I'm taking on these other side projects in let's say still photography so I'm, I'm still making my living taking pictures but that's not really what I want to focus on it's this and instead of working at a bar or a restaurant I'm saying yes to corporate shoots or corporate headshots but then really what I want to do is this. So, but yeah, I, I guess that's, that's that main point. It's like when, when you're in this desperate situation, you take on anything that comes your way versus really being able to be picky saying like, this is actually what I want. This is the type of, let's say it's weddings. This is the type of couple I want to shoot. And I'm only going to say yes to that because when I say yes to everything else, one, now all of a sudden you're going to be booked possibly when that dream couple does come your way or like that perfect couple does come your way and you've got to say no and you've got this other couple that you're like, ugh, I, that's going to be really difficult. But like that that can apply to like shooting commercially, that can apply to, you know, shooting editorially, like all of those sort of things, like really being able to like sit down and think like, this is the direction I want to go. And I, and I think it helps when you don't have to say yes to everything. Yeah, I've already. This is this was my big lesson for for our or from our conversation rather the significance of desperation and how that drives certain behavior. There's a tendency for desperation to do something that we talk about a lot here on the podcast, which is to to go into reactive mode versus proactive mode. So I heard you just talk about the about sitting down and thinking about what it is that you actually want. That's a proactive mentality. And I think that's something that we have to very consciously do on, on all levels in life, including certainly our photography business. And it's yet again, a good reminder, make sure to stay out of desperation mode. I think that's a, a great lesson for all of us. I want to go a little bit different direction totally. here. And and that is your photography website. This is something I find really interesting. That I, and I know that you're a, a very accomplished photographer. You you shoot on the, the higher end or even higher end of higher end. And one of the things that I noticed about your photography website is it's extremely minimalist in nature. No bells, no whistles. It's not fancy. And yet you find yourself an extremely successful photographer. You're working with high-end clients. Can you explain that? Uh, we might call it a discrepancy, but it's probably not even a discrepancy. What is your perspective on the role of a website for you and maybe just in general for a high-end wedding photographer? Yeah, I generally think less is more. Uh, I think that being really intentional with what you are putting out as like the face of your brand is really important as well. You know, it's like, I'd really try to, I mean, I take a lot of photos on a day that are all different. And I, I tell couples a lot of the times like, Hey, listen, we're going to get both. And, you know, it's like, we're going to get the photos that are 
really editorial and cool and look really candid in this. But then we're also going to like, I'm going to stop you, take a portrait, and it's but it's going to happen really quick. But we're getting the photo that mom's going to want to hang on the wall, and we're going to get a photo that you're going to want to hang on the wall. So I'm generally just showing the photos that I feel like the couple that I want to be looking to book me, that's what I'm going to show because that's what thing that I want to attract. And so, and with that, like, usually I'm showing photos that have emotion that have like some sense, like I've, it was funny when I first, I started asking people like, what, like, what drew you in to my work? And people's answer was like, I really love your candid work. And I, and it took me a while, like a couple answers where I was like, what, like, what do you mean? Can like, none of my work is candid. All of it is directed. All of it is like very intentional. And it's like, Oh, like my, I direct in a way so that my photos look candid. You know, and, and that's really like the photos that I'm most drawn to. That's what I'm putting out online. And it's usually that photo that act, like they're actually laughing or they're, you know, like really smiling and versus like something I told them. It's like, I don't like photos. I, I just did a shoot with a mo- like couple models and I, I went in there and I told them, um, like, listen, here's how I usually direct. Here's what I want for my couples. So it's like, you're not going to, I don't want you to look like models. Like you need to be smiling. You, I, I don't want you to look like you're posing or looking really good. Um, so, I mean, that's, I, yeah, I guess that's a long answer to say, like, in terms of the minimalist, I, I'm really just, I like things clean and simple and I, I don't want it to be really distracting and have them all over the place or get a all different idea about different things. But I would say at this stage in the game, the typical bride that finds me online, that is just inquiring without a planner, like I'm out of their budget. So I know that almost 99% of the time. So the only weddings that are really coming my way are coming from wedding planners that are, you know, they're a high end wedding planner. Therefore their clients are on the higher end side and they've had their expectations set. Like this is around where they're going to be spending. And most of them are like three day, three to four day wedding weekends that are destinations. And so a lot of it's been pre-qualified from the planner and then they are able to come to my site and see their work. Um, I have a mix. I used to have two separate sites, but now on the same site, I have an editorial portion, which is more like music and fashion. And then I've got the wedding stuff. And and that's pretty intentional because the type of couples that I really love to shoot are the ones that have some, they either work in those industries or they're actors or they're musicians, or they have a love for those things or a love for fashion. And yeah, so, so there's definitely intention with those things, but I think a lot of it at, at this stage in my career, it's it's coming through relationships that I've built over the years with wedding planners that do really, really amazing high-end weddings. So one of the things that I was noticing when I said that your, your site is minimalist in nature, I think the big distinction between your site and a lot of photography websites I'm seeing these days is you don't spend a lot of time talking about yourself or selling yourself or your personality. And you mentioned just a little bit ago that most of your business now comes from wedding coordinators. So you're not actually having to do the selling of yourself. Uh, these wedding coordinators or planners are doing the selling for you. Would you say that that's a big distinction between kind of that mid-level wedding in comparison to the high-end market? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think, I mean, I'm actually making a big, like the thing with me is I feel like I tell, I generally, I don't give out pricing on my website. People have to inquire and I generally try not to give out pricing when they inquire because I want to meet with them. I want to, I want to be able to see one, if they're the type of couple that I want to shoot. And then at that stage, like, can we make something work or two? I want to be able to give, if, if I, if I send my pricing out and it's just to like a general inquiry, I'm not going to hear back from them. So I want to be able to hear from them. And I, I, I mean, I probably waste a lot of time in people's opinion, but I meet with a lot of couples and I, um, I, I feel like the thing that I do best, there's a lot of really, really amazing photographers out there. There's a lot of really amazing websites out there. But what I really can offer is the personality that I have and the connection that I have with that I'm able to give and direct and help my couples and actually like serve them. And so that's one of those things that's really hard to just see looking at websites. And so um, I, I'm actually making, and I, and I would say like for anyone, I, I think it's the most important thing that we have to offer is that piece Just like, yeah, there's a lot of people that take good photos, but like, what's different about you? What are you going to bring to the day? Because I feel like on a wedding day, your photographer plays the most intimate role in the day. You know, so I've been creating a new about video that is really like trying, 
almost the stuff that I talk about in my client meetings, just be able to sort of get it out there. So people know when they're coming really what to expect. So, I mean, it's, it's not on there very much and I would say, yes, it's worked, but I I'm changing that. And I think that it's almost one of the most important components is that personal element of what you bring. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, we're looking forward to seeing that that new video. And, and speaking of video content too, we, we we talked about the photo report, the artist report earlier, and we've we'll link to that YouTube channel so that our listeners can see the content. But you also have a personal YouTube channel, and one of the videos that you created is a really great one describing the photo gear that you travel with for shoots. And we'll link to that in the show notes. But you mentioned the Rolleiflex. It's a twin lens. For those of you listening who aren't familiar. Uh, with this camera. It's a twin lens, six by six camera. And uh, actually my favorite film camera that I own is a Yashica, basically the poor man's version of the, the Rolly uh, twin lens, six by six camera. <laughs> Everything's completely manual. And I love shooting with that camera as some of my most favorite work I've created with that camera. But you're a film shooter. Is this your favorite camera? Or what would you say is your favorite film camera? That is such, I mean, I, if you see that video, you'll see how much gear that I carry. And I actually like wear it almost all on a shoot. So I, I can be wearing up to five cameras on me at a time. Wow. And sometimes I'd have six if I was carrying some sort of Polaroid of some sort, but, or a Holga, but, um, like each and why I do that is because each camera has such a specific tool usage for me. And I'm, so I'm, and I usually like on the right side of my body, I keep all color. And on the left side of my body, I keep all black and white. So just everything I, now I know, like when I grab for a camera, I know what's in it, um, where it gets way too confusing when there's that many cameras and that many different options. But, um, I, I love, love the Rolleiflex, especially like traveling I love it for, I usually only get like a few portraits or a few pictures of that with like, you know, throughout a day, because it is a little bit of a slower camera. It's you're for people don't know. It's like, it's one of those where like it pops up, you're looking down at it instead of looking through it. Um, And it shoots in a square format. Really it's beautiful. Um, And and it's also like built in the 1960s or so. Like it's, it's an old camera. It's like really difficult to replicate that sort of a look. It's got this beautiful, beautiful, like circular bokeh almost that is just, like you said, it's hard to replicate. It's just stunning. Yeah. And so I, I have two contacts, six, four, five cameras, and that's a medium format, which it versus 35 millimeter. And so I usually am shooting those for uh, tighter portraits or then detail work. And that has like a 80 millimeter 2.0 lens on there. And then I have two 35 millimeter film cameras that I'm, that's more for action. And I, or I'll be able to throw like the 70 to 200. I can use all my like regular Canon lenses you would on your typical digital. And so I, I have like my 70 to 200 on one. I'll have a 50 millimeter on the other. And those are more for like walking, moving, and I can manually or auto focus those versus the other ones are all auto or manual focus and a little bit slower and just, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm using literally all of them throughout the entire day. And do you shoot digital at all or is a hundred percent of your work film? Yeah, I'm shooting digitally in like mostly once it gets either dark or I'm in like a really dark church or once the reception happens and most all of the dancing is happening on digital. And I'm still, if if I'm, let's say I'm 90% film, 10% digital during the day. And generally I might even be 0% digital during the day at night. I might be 90% 90% digital, 10% film, where I'm still shooting a higher speed, 3200 black and white film. And that's that would be mostly for like the father-daughter dance, the first dance. Like those, I feel like those really classic wedding moments, they, there's just something so timeless about them on film that I really, really am drawn to. Oh, especially that that um, 1600 or 3200 speed film with that really rich grain. That It's hard to, to replicate that. It's absolutely beautiful. What would you say drives your passion for film? Where does this passion for film come from? I mean, you're shooting film, you have, you own the film supply cub. Where does, where does that all come from? Yeah. The, I, I mean, I've always just, when I first got into photography, I was really drawn to, I mean, I was started on music photography. So I was really drawn to like old Annie Leibovitz and who are some of the other guys? Like I love like Richard Avedon there's a guy named Bruce Weber, like all of these older photographers that shot either fashion or music, their film work, there was just something to it that captivated me. And I could never, and I started, I, I went through all of a local community colleges, film, film department. I wanted to learn how to like really, I wanted to 
print in a dark room, develop in a dark room. I wanted to shoot large format cameras and really like understand all those sort of things. And it just captivated me, I guess. And, and when people ask me now, it's like, why do you do that? Digital is so good. And it's like, it's a complete aesthetic choice for me. It's like, I, there's, there's something to a, an image shot on film that like it moves me where a digital image does not. And I like can't always explain it. Sometimes I, I say it's the difference of watching something in high depth versus watching an older film. It's like, I don't TVs with like super high depth. Like I, I hate watching it. Yeah. Um, it's almost like too real. It almost doesn't look real. There's something about digital being square pixels where film is round grain. Maybe there's something about that where it's a, still sharp, but it's not quite as sharp. But yeah, I don't know. I especially when it comes to black and white film, I think it's really, really difficult to replicate what you can do on film versus digital. And then there's medium format versus 35 millimeter. There's a whole other element to that where you shoot them right next to each other. And I think hands down, every time I'm going to be gravitated towards the medium format image. Oh, it's absolutely stunning. Yeah, there, there was a. I started my wedding career, my wedding photography career on 35 millimeter film did a segment on medium format or incorporating medium format. I ended up going back to, to strictly 35, but it really is tough to beat the, I hate to use the word cause it's not fully accurate, but the resolution, I mean the, the detail and, and also depth, the depth of field uh, with a medium format camera in comparison to the 35, it's, it's just a whole different look and feel. It is a different aesthetic. It has a certain character about it that is quite unique. And for those of you listening and who've never gotten a hold of a medium format camera and, and photographed it, you can actually go on eBay and grab uh, that Yashica twin lens camera that I mentioned earlier for probably like 50 bucks or 100 bucks. And it would be a wonderful, wonderful foray into to uh, film and you can get your film from film supply club. This is really a great segue actually into uh, my next question, which is just driven by yeah curiosity about where film supply club came from. I mean, you have an obvious passion for film, you're shooting film, but what got this company, this new company started? I, I know that there's a lot of a big community piece to uh, associated with it as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about the company? Totally. Yeah. It's, it's been really fun. I launched it about a year ago maybe it's about a year and a half and we have somewhere around like 450 members. And so the idea came about, I I mentioned earlier, I was at a gym listening to a book called the automatic customer. And, and that the whole premise of that book, it was talking, the author, I forget his name had written a, another book, which was talking about how do you basically sell your, like set up your company to sell it. And after he wrote that book, he came, he's like, you know, the, mo- the best thing that you can have is recurring revenue. So how do you create recurring revenue? And throughout the book, all of a sudden, the idea popped into my head. I was like, what if, because I, from speaking at WPPI and like being out there and being known in that community, I knew the reps for Kodak and Fuji. And so in my head, I was like, what if I could get film at wholesale, pass on those savings to all of my friends, and then charge a small membership fee and save, basically, it, it'd be like, I'm such a people pleaser by nature. Like the the thing that I needed it to be is like how am I, how can I like help like all these people versus just like creating something that's taking. And so it really is like it was created as like support system as a way to get all of my friends discounts on film, and then hopefully like for that whole, the whole film shooting community, how can it how can this become a resource? And so um, and it and it really has become that. We've we've if you go to the front page filmsupply.club it'll say um, it'll tell you how much money we've saved our members and so from there we started thinking through like what is every single thing you could use as a photographer that you need and so we have partnerships and relationships that as a member you get discounts with whether that's gallery hosting or with a film lab or with um, albums or with you know potentially photo editing after talking with you and <laughs> so so there you know there's things like that so it's like everything as a photographer then there's also this really cool community and everything from like being able to like pass through referrals or now when I travel for weddings I just sort of hit up my my mem- like I had a wedding in Knoxville Tennessee and I just sort of wrote to all my members in Nashville or Tennessee and it's like hey do you have any recommendations for second shooters or any of that. So it's, we've been starting to do meetups, been starting to bring in an education piece. And yeah, so it's, it's hopefully what I've created is this, this resource and community versus just like another store. So, so yeah, it's, it's all that. 
Well, which is yet again, it seems to be driven by that, as you mentioned, that desire to help others. And, and I love that you're finding an outlet through that in business. You know, it's, it's one thing, and this is something that I talk about uh, kind of on my own in, in conversation and so forth, but uh, it's one thing to, to run a business and, you know, just run a business for the sake of the numbers. It's another thing to be able to find, to borrow kind of a cliche phrase these days or word these days, your why. Um, a, a deeper motivation that drives everything that you do. And it makes it that much more enjoyable and that much more fulfilling in the end. So I, I love that you found an outlet for that. I think it's absolutely beautiful. And of course, we'll link everyone to filmsupply.club in the show notes as well. You guys make sure you go check that out. Going back to really original point of conversation today, I'm, I'm curious, you talked about shooting, of course, weddings and editorial, running Film Supply Club, plus creating content and you mentioned your family, how, how do you balance all of this? And I know balance is really an overused word. I guess maybe more specifically, what does a day in the life look like for Braden Fl- Flynn? How do you manage all of this? Yeah, it's, it's been one of the most internally difficult like, things I've had to deal with in my life, I think. <laughs> and it's, it's a really, br- like, for someone who cares a lot about being good at everything that he does, which is me, and being also a perfectionist in that it's, there's been a lot of like self mutilation of like feeling like a failure in every single area. Even, I mean, even from the outside, you'd be like, Oh, you are killing it. You know, like the element of like not being able to do everything really well has been a really difficult battle for me. And it's something I'm trying to learn to give myself grace. And even every, like we just had our fourth kid in December of last year. So he's about eight months old now. And you know, it's, it's exhausting. None of our kids have slept ever, <laughs> and, you know? So like there, there's so many different elements of like my, and I'm traveling a ton. And so my wife is beat up my, you know, we're both exhausted. It's trying in, then in launching a company, there's so much needed to really do that. And then feeling like, man, if I could, I could just dedicate a little bit more time, it could be so much bigger or better but having to learn to be okay with where things are right now versus, I mean, this, this is like the biggest lesson that I'm trying to teach myself. And I, I would like pray that like anyone listening could learn earlier than I can <laughs> is to one, give yourself grace, but two is like, I'm such a driven person that I'm always looking down the line. And in this, I'll, I'll, this is my long version of getting to this point of like, I had an employee for a while who, I was booking the biggest gigs of my career. And she's also an inspired aspiring photographer was working, probably worked with me for five years at this point. And, you know, I was just like, it was never good. I was never like stoked. I was never, it was never good enough. And she's like, Brayden, you're sort of lame. Like what? Like, and I was like, excuse me. <laughs> and, and she's like, like, what, like, how do you, how do you think like, like the things that you're doing is like people would be dreaming of doing and it's not ever good enough for you. Like why, like what is good enough? And, and how do you think that that makes me feel who like w- would kill for anything even close to that? You know, and it really set me back thinking of being like, Oh crap, that's right. And, and it's been this shift to learning one to not just be focused on what's down the road, but learn how to appreciate and be grateful for where you are, no matter where you are in the process and enjoy the process versus you just like enjoy the journey not just the destination but like that is such a true statement what's that book the alchemist yeah you ever read that one yeah you know so it's like how the at the end of that story it's like how do you like walk across this field holding the spoon not spilling the liquid but then also seeing everything around you while you're there Mm. um i think that that has been it's been really it's like honestly it's been really really difficult for me and I haven't done a good job. It basically, it's become, it's been like massive amount of overworking and never taking a day off and never stopping. And, you know, I have pretty high capacity, so I've been able to do that. But I think it's taken a toll on a lot of areas of my life, specifically my family. And I don't really like that. And so those are things that I'm, I'm learning to to stop working at a certain point. I'm learning to be present and be like, it's also at a stage where it's like, I, I'm not desperate for success anymore. I feel like I've arrived at a certain level and, and gotten there and been like, this is like, what is all this for? Like there's, there's nothing glorious up here. And, you know, I've, I've, been, I've gotten every accolade I could ever want in any sort of from any magazine or whatever. And it's like, it's, 
all, like extremely flattering and extremely great, but it's like, it's all meaningless. It's all absolutely stupid. Like all of this is dumb. Mm. And the only things that are actually important are the people in your lives, yeah. your friends, and especially your family. And it's like, it's just work, man. Like, what are you like, snap out of it, you idiot. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's been like my, like the last couple of years is my journey that I've been like a recovering workaholic. And yeah, that's just getting honest with you. Well, and, and I appreciate that transparency and, and vulnerability. I, I can very much relate um, at this idea that that much, if not you know, most of, of everything that we do on a day-to-day basis in life, especially in first world culture, is, is a game. That idea has been something that's kind of resonating through my mind as of late. And, and to your very point, at the end of the day, the one thing that we all have in common that uh, we may not just want, but actually need physiologically, psychologically, emotionally need is relationships. And if we're not making time, proactively making time for those relationships, uh, we all suffer. And um, so I, I love that really and in, in kind of the end of our conversation here that you've highlighted that that's ultimately what this podcast is about is is figuring out ways to work more efficiently so that we have time for the important things in life. And uh, I, again, I appreciate your transparency and reminding us uh, of uh, all of, of that. In closing, if you don't mind, will you share again? I know we mentioned your websites, but maybe share with our listeners um, where they can find you on social media and how they can follow the latest of what you're doing. Totally. Yeah. And it's been really rad having this conversation with you. Thanks for having me on. But the I would say my favorite thing that I'm pouring a lot of energy into right now is the YouTube channel where I'm, I'm really doing a lot more like behind the scenes. Like I'm actually hiring videographers to come follow me along on shoots. And then I'm talking about them as they're happening and giving more of a behind the scenes of like how I affect what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, how I'm shooting film, why I'm shooting film, all those sort of things. And that's just, I think if you search on YouTube, my name, Braden Flynn, B R A E D O N. My mom spelled it that way. I just went with it. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it's almost everything. Twitter's, I don't, I don't really use that as much anymore. Um, Braden Flynn, Instagram's Braden Flynn. Um, you could, I, if you search the artist report on YouTube, you'd find that, or it's the artist report.com. There's more stuff on YouTube than there is on the website. And then same deal, the photo report, if you search that, that's just the site. All of the photo report videos are connected to the artist report um, YouTube channel and then film supply dot club is film supply club. And that's, that's a really epic resource. And you, I mean, even if you don't shoot film and you take advantage of the other partnerships we have, you'll save a ton of money. And again, that's just a resource there. And I, I get so many photographers, even just emailing in that are newer photographers. And I almost do like counseling, <laughs> not counseling, but like uh, consulting with them. It's like, yeah. I, rising tide rises all ships a good old saying but it's really like being able to like help build up the community it's like it kills me when i hear photographers not charging enough especially if they're shooting film Mm. it's like my base cost at a wedding shooting just film ends up being about just the film part is like two thousand dollars a wedding oh you know so it's expensive but and then my website bradenphotography.com Perfect. And we'll link to all those in the show notes. And then and then you also, the content that you're creating, or at least some of the content that you're creating for the photo report and the artist report also go into audio format in, in the form of a podcast, correct? Correct. Yeah. And so those are two separate podcasts. And there's the artist report, which that's non-photographers. And it's mostly like, I have a lot of friends that are illustrators, designers, authors, things like that. Um, and then the photo report is all photographers. And I'm, I'm the honest answer is I'm putting a lot more attention to the photo report, the photo report right now. And so that will be where more content is coming up. And I've interviewed a lot of pretty rad. Most, most of them are film shooters, but I've, I've got some others sprinkled in there as well. That's awesome. Well, we'll make sure to link to all this in the show notes, Braden, truly thank you for uh, taking us down. Well, taking us through kind of your past, your history, where you came from and then what you're doing right now and sharing so openly with us. I appreciate you making time for the book podcast. You got it. I hope some something that I mentioned in there can be taken away as a little nugget that can, uh, it, if anything, just be graceful to yourself. <laughs> you know, like it's okay where you are in the process and just enjoy it. Like take that away and that's all you need. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Braden. You got it. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. 
my direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com.